from, where are we, Brent? Norwood? Katy. We're in Katy, Texas. We'll be passing through Katy on our way out to the Canyon Lake area of Texas. Going to check on our dear friend Corky out at Quest Ranch. Getting ready for a summer camp later in August for our church, Grace Point at Eagle Heights in Orange, Texas. But for now, this is Wednesday night Bible study. Okay. Hello, everyone. With, uh oh, let me mute that. Sorry. This is a Wednesday night Bible study, riding in cars with pastors or something like that. But I am here with uh, Brent Norwood, who's driving. I'm just riding. I'm not driving. I've got Brock and Monty and Pete also here traveling with us. So uh, they say hello to everyone. So let's pray together and we're going to get started. Tonight we'll be in Psalm 96. We're talking about worship tonight, a call to worship. So let's pray together and we'll get started tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity. We thank you for this day. Father, for the fact that the clouds have passed over, the storm has moved past us. We're now heading out of the stormy weather. We are so grateful for that right now, Lord, as we travel. Father, I pray you continue to watch over us traveling, that you would be with my dear friends as they're at home or at work or wherever they may be right now watching and studying with us, Lord God. And Father, I pray that you would be honored and glorified tonight in this time of Bible study. And we ask all of these things in Christ Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Uh, just so you know, Brent did not have his eyes closed while he was praying and driving. He was driving and praying with his eyes open. Isn't that right, Brent? That's true. Amen. Okay, so everyone's glad about that. Well, if you would, turn to Psalm 96. And while you turn there, let me go ahead and let you know that uh, I'm sitting in the back seat here of this SUV. I think you can see it may be too bright at the moment with the sun where it is, but uh, behind us later, you might be able to see the city skyline. You'll probably be able to see some of the traffic as well, but uh, hopefully you won't see a car approaching too quickly to us because we are traveling. So this is a new experience for me. I'm sure it's a new experience for you. Hopefully it'll be one that will be safe for all of us and uh, maybe we'll do it again sometimes. Um, so let's see, Psalm 96. Go ahead and turn there, you should be there. Let me give you a little background about that Psalm. Psalm 96 was, was uh, written, it's a Psalm that was used by David, I should say. Uh, psalm 96 is, you'll find parts of this Psalm in Psalm 97, 98, even Psalm uh, 100. You'll find parts of these Psalms in 1 Chronicles 16. At the dedication of the tabernacle um, for the nation of Israel, you'll see that King David himself was using part of these psalms in their call to worship. In fact, this psalm is just that, a call to worship the Lord, the righteous judge. And so we're going to look at that. Now, obviously, we today are not Israel. I know I may have some Jewish friends who may be watching, but the church, I want you to understand, is not the nation of Israel. The church has not replaced Israel. God still has a plan for his church. He has a plan for his Israel as well. And so we, we've talked about that somewhat the last two Wednesday nights as we've talked about the tribulation. We looked at the purposes for the tribulation. Uh, we'll look at that again. We're actually going to spend one of our Wednesday nights looking at the differences between Israel and the church, seeing why the two are not the same. Uh, there's something like uh, 21 reasons, uh, differences that I have found. I'm sure there are more. We will not try to cover all of those in one Wednesday night, but we'll talk about a few of them and see why God has a plan and purpose for Israel and a destiny for them, but also for his bride, the church. Israel is the bride of Yahweh, the bride of the Father. The church is the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, I know some of you may be having questions about that. Uh, our triune God, talking about the Trinity, God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all of those things. All of that is to come in some of the upcoming Wednesday night Bible studies. Our dear brother uh, PJ LeBlanc has done just the last week or so a good Bible study on the triunity of God, looking at the Trinity. And so you can catch that. Uh, just look for PJ LeBlanc on Facebook. You can find that. It was also done as a Facebook Live Bible study as well. I think it's archived in our church um, page as well, Grace Point and Eagle Heights, their own Facebook. So hopefully you're at Psalm 96 now. And as I was saying, this was used at the dedication of the tabernacle for the nation of Israel. King David would have read this. There would have been this call to praise for the people. Uh, many churches have, have uh, calls to praise as such. Some would read Psalms. Uh, some just have uh, maybe uh, 
a certain song they may play every Sunday or, or, or a few different songs maybe they'll use interchangeably. Uh, we don't do a specific type of uh, call to worship in that regards at our church very often, but we do tend to start with something a little more celebratory, trying to draw people in so that they will focus upon the Lord. That's the point. And just remember that uh, um, the music, and we'll talk about this a little bit more here later, but the music isn't just the, the worship part, okay? Uh, all of our life is to be worship unto God, amen? And so we are living sacrifices, and everything we do, even riding in a car with a preacher, this is an act of worship, okay? And so uh, we want to just make that distinction, but but singing and, and other things like that, those are ways in which we can praise the Lord. And so we're going to talk about that now. So let's look. Psalm 96. I wanted you to know also that I'm doing the slides tonight. So, so many of you have commented over the past weeks that it's so professional looking with the graphics coming up and, and uh, um, my big head moving down to the lower corner, right? But uh, I'm not sure how well I'll be able to do all of those things. But I'm going to make sure that the scriptures and the graphics get placed on even if I go off of the screen. I am not the most important part of this message by any means. So uh, just note it's not going to be as smooth because A, we're traveling, and B, I'm the one doing the graphics. Everybody good with that? All right. Well, let's uh, have a commercial break, and then when we come back... No, I'm just kidding. There's no commercials here. So Psalm 96, what I want us to do is go ahead and we'll start here in Psalm 96. And I want you to notice that this is a call to worship. This is a call to worship. And in this Psalm, there are 13 verses. Okay, there are 13 verses that make up this Psalm. And I know what some of you are thinking, 13 verses, we're going to be here for about 55 or 70 minutes tonight. We, we should not be going that long tonight. This flows very quickly. But I wanted to do this tonight because we have spent the last several weeks looking at a pretty heavy topic or two. We've talked about the rapture of the church, the second coming of Christ. We've talked about the day of the Lord in judgment. And so we've talked about the tribulation. So we've looked at some very heavy subject matter. Uh, pertaining to the end times. What I want you to see tonight is that there is something lighter that's coming and something joyful and glorious that's also coming beyond that great tribulation. And this psalm points toward that very event. And the event that I'm speaking of is that millennial kingdom, the 1,000 year literal reign of Christ upon the earth that the apostle John speaks of in Revelation chapter 20. It's also mentioned in Psalm 2 and throughout the Old Testament and other places in the New Testament as well. But in Revelation chapter 20, the Apostle John gives us a very detailed look in just a matter of about seven or eight verses in Revelation chapter 20, starting at verse 1. He tells us over and over again, six times no less, that that millennial reign of Christ is 1,000 years long. That Jesus will return at his second coming. He will put down all of his enemies with the sword of his mouth, the word of his mouth, smiting all of his enemies, as it says in the King James Version. It's a great word to smite, to be smitten, <laughs> but uh, he will do that and then establish that 1,000 year reign. There will be peace and perfection upon the earth under the rule and the reign of Christ. And so let's dive into the psalm and we're going to look at it in three parts. So if you want to take notes, let me give you the three parts right now. The first point is this. We're going to see that we are to sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. That's number one. I'll give you a moment. The second point we'll make is that we are to give unto the Lord. So we sing to the Lord. We give to the Lord. And then finally, the last thing we'll talk about tonight is that we are to look unto the Lord. And this is applicable not just for the the dedication of the tabernacle under King David in the Old Testament in 1 Chronicles 16 and following. This is not just going to be practical for us in the Millennial Kingdom as we uh, will enjoy that time of peace and harmony for 1,000 years with the Lord God and then eternity will begin thereafter. But it's appropriate for us to study and understand now. We can still live this very same way today in Christ. Amen? And so that's a goal for every one of us in Christ to seek to worship the Lord in the manner in which we're going to talk about here right now. So let's go ahead and look at those first few verses, if you will. So you'll see here on the screen verses 1, 2, and 3. So let's talk about this first point, that we are to sing unto the Lord. So follow along with me. Sing to the Lord a new song. 
Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Now let me just remind you real quick, when you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, all caps the word Lord, what is that that we're reading in English? We're reading the divine name of God. It is Yahweh, what we're seeing there. We, we transliterate it out into English as Lord in all caps so that we can identify that that is that divine name, that name, uh, there's no vowels in it, so we're not exactly sure how it's pronounced. That, that word that was used only of consonants, but that was the name that, that the Jews were afraid to, to write out. They were afraid to use in fear of accidentally blaspheming God. All right, so we see that that is what is being mentioned here, the Lord. So we're singing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the peoples. And so what we see here is that call to worship. And David tells us as he's talking here at the tabernacles he's using the psalm at the tabernacle in first chronicles 16 he's calling on the people just as we're reading it and being called upon now ourselves to sing unto the lord the lord is worthy of our praise is he not he is worthy of our affection of our attention and we are to sing to him and as we see here uh, we proclaim good tidings of his salvation we sing to him because he is glorious we bless his name because he is yahweh he is the god of all gods and and it's going to give us other reasons here to worship him as we make our way through this psalm over the next few minutes but we see that we have this new experience with god now for those of us who are in Christ, that's exactly what's happening. We, we are relating to the Lord in a new way. Now again, we are not Israel, but we're taking the principles from the psalm that were given to the nation of Israel and we're applying them to ourselves as the church today. Okay? And so we as the church, we are in Christ. And so we have a new relationship with the Lord God. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians, almost said 2 Chronicles, 2 Corinthians 5.17 that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature a new creation the old things have passed away behold new things have come and so as we engage the lord god now we are doing it from a different standing a different point of view our standing before the lord was one that was under judgment before christ saved us before he called us to himself we were under the wrath of god we were destined to be separated from god for an eternity because of our sin and before any of us dare say, I haven't sinned, there's no great sins about my life for which the Lord should judge me or condemn me. Friend, know that you were steeped into sin at birth, as was I. We were steeped into sin before we were born. There's none righteous, not one, the Bible tells us. We were all born into sin. We've all been born of Adam. And friends, if we do not repent of our sins and come to faith in Christ Jesus, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone, then we will die in Adam and die in our sins. And there will be no help for us. There's no second chance of salvation after death. There's no um, purgatory. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 tells us it's appointed once in a man to die and then comes judgment. There's no chance beyond this life. So while we yet have breath, we should give ourselves unto the Lord. Amen. We should give ourselves unto the Lord in repentance, in trust, in faith. And when we do that, we will see that even as gloomy as COVID-19 might possibly be, even as difficult as being separated from our loved ones have been over the last few months, even as hard as job loss is, even the death of a loved one or the passing of, 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 of a child or, or whatever physical ailment or, or whatever life event may happen to us, all of those horrible things are bearable because of Christ Jesus. And for those of us who are in Christ, if I could just get serious here for a moment, we know that God works all things together for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And even the darkest hours of our day, God can be glorified through us by means of those events in our lives. Amen. That's hard to say, folks. I know, I know, I know you've experienced some things out there probably, as have I, but God is worthy of our praise regardless of what the day brings us. He is worthy, and thus we sing unto his name. Amen. And we
we sing a new song. I like old hymns. I like some new songs, as long as they're biblical, okay? Um, they've got to have a good beat, and you, got, you ought to be able to dance to them, right? That sure, surely doesn't hurt. But if the words are good and honoring of the Lord, if they're scriptural, if they don't twist scripture, if they don't emphasize me, 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 if they put the emphasis on Jesus, 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 then it's most likely a good song, right? And so we can sing those songs, the old songs, or as it tells us here in verse 1 and verse 2, we can sing unto the Lord and we can sing a new song. It's interesting that when you come to the Lord, it seems that you have a, a pep in your step that you didn't have before. I don't know about you, but that was true for me. Uh, I, I was a, a pretty easy go kind of guy before Christ, but when Christ saved me, a burden was lifted off my back. Some of you I know are familiar with the story of the Pilgrim's Progress written by John Bunyan. That imagery of the burden being heavier and heavier and heavier. Friends, when Christ comes, that burden is removed. And so we have a new outlook. We have a pep in our step and there is a joy to live in. Even in the direst of circumstances, amen? We can sing unto the Lord. He is worthy of praise. And we sing because of, of his salvation. We sing from day to day. And the joys of that salvation, friends, are not something from which we graduate from. We do not get past salvation. I pray that you never get tired of hearing about, reading about, learning about, hearing uh, pastors preach about salvation unto the Lord. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone, that is the subject of all subjects as far as Scripture is concerned. It is of the highest tier of of. of um, of, 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 of scripture in my humble estimation. We should be joyous on all occasions about our salvation experience. So he is our Lord. So we sing to the Lord, but not just, not just any Lord and not just someone else's Lord. He's our Lord. And I know folks get hung up on, on this teaching called Lordship Salvation, but dear friend, just know this, it's really not that big of an issue. If you are a Christian, Jesus Christ is your Lord. Is he not? And if Jesus Christ is not your Lord, guess what? You're not a Christian. <laughs> You're not a Christian. Now the reality is, if we want to get technical, he is everyone's Lord. He is the Lord of Lords. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And one day the Bible tells us that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. That will happen. And right now, you and I who are called by his name, he is our Lord. We are his bond slaves, his bond servants. Doulos is the word the scripture uses. So we belong to him. What he says goes. And he is, just be, just, just, just remember, I'm getting excited over here, Monty, sorry. He is the Lord of Lords. And so we need to bow our knee to him now. We sing unto the Lord, still on point one, because he is worthy of our praise. So now, look down with me. We've looked at those first three verses. Look again there at the end there in verse three. Proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. So every day brings new opportunities for us to worship the Lord and sing praises unto his name. Does it not? Yes, it does. Every single day, there is something for which we can praise the Lord. If you are awake today, you have reason to praise the Lord. Amen? If you are riding in a car with your friend Brent and you have not been in an accident, there is reason to praise the Lord. Amen? Amen, Amen everyone in the car says. There's always something for which we can sing unto the Lord. He is good. You just got bad news? It could have been worse, dear friend. Sing praises unto the Lord. Realize that for those of us who are in Christ, once again, remember, all things work together for good to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. He is always good. He always was. He always will be good. There is nothing evil about Him. Now, I've got to readjust myself here. My leg is going to sleep. <laughs> this is a new experience for me, trying to do this from back here. Give me just a moment. I know you can hear me, and thank the Lord you're only looking at the Scripture on the screen right now. Let me get readjusted here. All right, so look at verse 3. Proclaim good tidings of His salvation from day to day. Tell of His glory among the nations, His wonderful deeds among all the peoples. Now, again, in this psalm, when this psalm was given, when it was used at the dedication of the tabernacle, King David was calling on Israel to proclaim the name, the worship, the value of the Lord God, the Almighty. 
we still, today as Christians in Christ, we still have the opportunity and the, the privilege of doing the very same thing. When you and I live our lives in such a way that God is honored, and then when we use the tongues that he's blessed us with to proclaim of his excellent glories and to share Christ with people, telling them that there's one way to be saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, there's there's only one because he is the way, the truth, and the life. When we do those things, we are doing exactly what Israel was called upon to do. We are proclaiming his glory among the nations. You see there in verse 3, telling his deeds among the peoples. Jesus is not just the Jesus for America. Jesus is the God of all creation. And Jesus is big enough to save peoples from every nation. And we know that he will because the book of Revelation tells us that that is so. That around the throne of God there will be peoples from every tribe and tongue and nation under the earth. Amen? Now remember, again, there's one race of humanity. And, and it's just that. The race of humanity. There aren't different races, but there are different nationalities. There are different nations. There are different ethnicities. But God is the God of all of those ethnicities. Amen? And He is worthy of our praise. And thus, we should praise God and we should tell of His glory among all the peoples, among the nations. That's why missions are so important. That's why missions are so important. That's why we're so excited to have our dear friend, Pastor Samuel, over in India, that we get to help monthly um, with our support from our church. Our people are giving and gracious and kind. They're very generous. We're able to help support that congregation in India. And Pastor Samuel and his family and that church that meets there in India, they are able, with their feet on the ground, being from India themselves, they are able to minister to the peoples around them in a way that we just probably could never really do even if we went there. Now, we do plan to go there still if the Lord wills it and we're able to do so, right? But Pastor Samuel is able to minister to people day after day. They feed children and families uh, weekly. They, they, they preach the gospel. They're training young men and women for ministry. They're doing tremendous things in other nations in India. They're, they're doing this, this tremendous thing on the other side of the world from us here in America. And we get to have a small part in that telling and that proclamation of the gospel and the glory of God. What a great thing. And I'm excited. I'm not saying that to boast about what our church is doing. I'm saying that for our church people because I want you to know how blessed I am as a pastor to be able to say that we do such things as a church body. It's a great thing. It is a glorious thing. And we are helping this very thing to be um, reality. The glory of God being expressed, being declared among the nations. What a good thing. But now look at verse 4 and verse 5. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all the gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord, or rather, but Yahweh made the heavens. Psalm 96 verse 4 and verse 5. And what do we see here? We see here that we are to sing unto the Lord. Yes, we are to then praise the Lord. We are to share that gospel message. And the reason is because God is worthy of our praise. Amen? God is worth it. He's worthy of our praise and our affection and our adoration. And so we tell of His goodness, of His greatness. He is worthy of that praise and he's to be feared above all so-called gods and notice what it says there in verse 5 again I say so-called for a reason because look what verse 5 says it says for all the gods of the peoples are what they are idols but the Lord is the one who made the heavens do you realize that the Lord God is the one true God every other so-called God is a false God either the invention of man it's just of someone's imagination or it's a demonic spirit right or it's nothing more than an idol or some some combination of those things but they are nothing there aren't different gods they aren't equal they aren't even different levels of gods with God maybe uh, the biblical God being the highest as someone told me recently and then there be there are other gods underneath him friends listen the Bible declares that God is the God the very God the only God the Lord God is the only God. There are none other gods, all but idols, it tells us here in verse 5. And what can an idol do to save anyone? Can an idol do anything to help you or to help me or to save anyone? Can an idol give you or me anything? The answer is what? 
Absolutely not. The answer is absolutely nothing. There's nothing that they can give. And yet, the Lord God can give us everything we need. In fact, the Bible tells us that God is good and that those things that come to us come through the very hands of God. And, and let me just, while, we, while we've mentioned that here, why we've mentioned that, and by we, I mean while I've mentioned that, let me just say, listen, when good things happen to us, just like you, I'm very quick to thank God for those things. But listen, you know as well as I do, it's a little more difficult when, when trying times come. Isn't it a little more difficult to thank God for those things? But friend, just know this, everything that happens to us is filtered through the hands of Almighty God. Nothing comes our way without coming past God's way. Amen? He is not a God that is distracted. He's not a God that maybe takes his eyes off of, oh, his people. Nothing, uh, no shiny object draws his attention away. His eye is on his creation. In fact, he's omniscient. He knows everything. He, he's everywhere at the same time. He's, he's omnipresent. He fills, inhabits the very universe that he created and then some. Amen? He is everywhere. He is bigger than everything and anything that we can imagine. And yet, he is mindful of us. And nothing happens to us, dear friend, that he is not aware of. Nothing happens to us that, that he doesn't orchestrate or allow for his glory, for our good. Just just remember that. That's extra. Just tuck that away. That's extra for us tonight. But just just remember, just I'm thinking about Job all of a sudden. Remember Job? Satan comes and, and what is what does the Lord God do? He says, Have you considered my servant Job? Job had everything, and God allowed Satan to take everything from Job except his life. He could harm his health. He took his family, his wife, his children, his livelihood, his property. Everything was removed from Job except for his life. And in the end, Job still praised God. And what did God do? God restored everything to him over and over and over again. The Lord is good, dear friends. He is worthy of our praise, great and glorious. Verse 5, the Lord God is the one who made, right, the heavens. He is the one who made the heavens. Now look at verse 6. The Bible tells us that splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Friends, these are tremendous attributes of the Lord God, no doubt, and descriptions of the Lord God, but they are not um, a comprehensive description of God. He is all of these things, splendid, majestic, strong, beautiful. All of those things are true of him, but he is so much more and so much more than we can fathom. The Lord God is good and worthy of our praise. And so what do we do? We sing to the Lord, point one. And here's the second thing that we do, dear friends. We give unto the Lord. Notice verses seven and verse eight. It says, ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. So to ascribe simply means to give unto the Lord. We're to ascribe, we're to give to the Lord. So that's why we said number one, sing to the Lord. We can honor the Lord in our worship by singing unto Him. But secondly, we can give unto the Lord. And so He tells us here in these verses, we saw there in those first couple verses, in verses 7 and 8, that we ascribe to God, and He says all the peoples of the earth were to give Him praise from our lips. And folks, listen, do you know where the praise from our lips comes from? That praise from our lips comes forth from our heart. From the overflow of the heart, the tongue does what? The tongue confesses. The tongue speaks. And so we sing unto the Lord. We praise God. We give Him glory from the overflow of our heart. Dear friend, where is your heart? Where is your heart's affection? Where is your mind's attention? Oftentimes when we pray, I'll pray something along these lines. That God, we pray that our mind's attention will be upon you and our heart's affection as well, O oh God. It's something along those lines. But it starts there. It starts on the inside of us. People could, you could run up and down the aisles with your with your tongue hanging out your mouth and your hands in the air, but if your heart's not in it, it's it's really you're nothing more than than a distraction to the people around you. But you're nothing more, as Paul would say, a loud, clanging, noisy gong or cymbal. 
Folks, God wants our heart first. And so we ascribe to the Lord from the overflow of our heart. And so how is your heart? Where is your heart today, dear friends? And so we worship the Lord. And let's let's read on. Look at the next verse here. That was verse 7 and 8. We bring an offering and come into his courts. Now again, this is written to Israel at the dedication of the tabernacle. And so obviously the language is very Hebraic here. And so giving unto the Lord, coming with an offering, coming into his courts. But as we do so spiritually, bringing the sacrifice of praise, it comes forth from our hearts. Our hearts have to be in it. So even before we look at verse 9, let me just stop for a moment and, and say this. Do you know when worship begins on Sunday mornings? So let's say if you're watching and you do not attend Grace Point and Eagle Heights with us there in Orange, Texas, but maybe you attend somewhere else. For us at Grace Point and Eagle Heights, our worship service begins at 1030. Now, we're going to be beginning our Bible study again. That starts at 930. That'll be beginning uh, in June, the second week of June. But when you come to church for Bible study or worship, when does worship begin? The answer is not at 1030. The answer is worship began before you ever left the house. You and I prepare our hearts for worship every second, every minute, every hour, every single day. We're worshiping something. Our heart's affection, our mind's attention is on something or someone constantly. And so we must always be making sure that we take captive those thoughts. We take captive the desires of our heart and make sure that we are ascribing to the Lord. We're giving to the Lord glory. He's worthy. He's absolutely worthy. I know I've shared with many of you before, but I've I've been struck, struggling uh, and and suffering oftentimes with Lyme disease, having three different strains of Lyme disease that I was infected with, most likely back around 2008. So it's been 12 years now, and Becky and I and my wife were just talking about this recently. Uh, it just doesn't seem like it's been 12 years, but 12 years there. <clears throat> Excuse me. There have been good days. There have been uh, great days. Having a pretty good day today, in fact. There have been absolutely horrible days where it was almost impossible to get out of bed. It was an act of God, okay, quote unquote, to want to get up. But 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 here's the difference, folks. The Lord has used even something as tragic as that has been over these last many years. The Lord has used it in order to be glorified, and I'm good with that. He has brought me to my knees, literally. Um, time after time again in order to break the pride that was in my life. Now, I'm not saying I've arrived yet. I, I, I'm not because the moment I say that, guess what? I'm being prideful and arrogant again, okay? Just like you would be if you said that you had arrived already. But dear friends, listen, I am confident that he who began a good work in me is going to carry it on and, 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 and do so to completion. That's the goal. So that God will be glorified and I will be like Christ. And if it takes the brokenness of this body, and I don't say this boastfully. I, 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 I don't. I don't say that for your affections either. Listen, I mean this because the Lord is, has taught me through this. If it takes the brokenness of this body for Christ to be made perfect in me, then guess what? The brokenness of this body is worth it. It's absolutely worth it. And I pray that you have that same mindset. It starts there in the mind. It starts in the heart. If my affections are on my health, if my affections are at the gym, and that's all I'm worried about is having a perfect outer shell, then my affections are wrong. I'm not saying being healthy is wrong. That's not what I'm getting at. I'm not saying exercise is wrong. In fact, exercise is good for us. But that is not the most important thing. My heart, my mind had better be ascribing unto the Lord and giving unto the Lord. And if He gives me good, praise God. If He gives me pain, guess what? Praise God. Amen? That's how worthy our God is. He's worthy of that attention and that affection no matter what He throws our way. And I pray that we come to that realization. Give unto the Lord. Now let's look back. Verses 9 and 10. We're making our way through here. We're not far now, right? Where are we, Brent? Location. Mile marker? We can't find a mile marker. We're somewhere between here and there, okay? All right, so look at verse 9. Verse 9, Worship the Lord in holy attire. 
Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Notice a couple of things there as we leave this on the screen for a few more moments. Worship the Lord in holy attire. What does that mean? Does that mean we have to dress a certain way when we come unto the Lord? Not at all. In fact, some of the commentators believe this is talking about worshiping the Lord because of His holy attire. He is clothed in splendor. He is robed in majesty. And so we worship the Lord. But if the other commentators are correct, and it is speaking about how we present ourselves unto the Lord, just know that we should want to bring our best to the Lord. That doesn't mean a coat and tie are required to attend worship service anywhere. I've been a part of congregations uh, uh, in the past who, who may have thought so. But folks, listen, the best that we have to offer is what God is worthy of. Amen? And that might be a pair of shorts. Now, they should be a certain length, obviously, right? But, uh, I mean, come on. But, but folks, just listen. Worshiping the Lord in holy attire has to do more so with our heart, our mind, than it does with the outer shell of who we are. That's what God looks at. God looks at the inward. Just, just realize that as we come unto the Lord, we are doing just that. We're coming unto the Lord. So we want to present unto the Lord. We do. We want to present the best that we have to offer. And again, I'm not making rules and regulations here. Just, just telling you one of the two views. One is that we should present ourselves well. The other is that God is clothed in majesty and splendor himself. And he is always presentable. And so we're worshiping him because of his glory and his splendidness. I like that um, translation of that passage personally, but either one of those may very well be accurate. So we give to the Lord with our lips from the overflow of our heart. We give to the Lord with the offerings of our hands. It goes on to tell us, look there, um, come before him, say among the nations, the world is firmly established. Where is right here? Trying to find the verses, sorry. I'm just not used to doing this part. I lost my verse. There it is. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Verse 7 and verse 8 there. We're bringing the best that we have to offer unto the Lord. We're worshiping unto the Lord because, again, he deserves our very best. He deserves our very best. We don't give him the leftovers. We give him of the first fruits. Now, as Christians today, we, again, are not Israel. We are not required under the law to tithe unto the Lord. Oh, what? We don't tithe. That's right. We don't talk about tithing in our church because we're not Israel. We're not under the law. What we do is we give unto the Lord. And so I use the ideal of the tithe as a starting point. Now, obviously, if we tithe exactly like the nation of Israel was required, we would be talking about some 30% of our income. How many of you tithe 30%? I'm putting my hand down because I don't want you to think that that's what we do. But we give unto the Lord. And, and, and here's the reality. I don't give unto the Lord the portion of my income that I want him to have. Here's, here's the truth. Every bit of income that I have, guess who it belongs to? It belongs to the Lord. You see, that's the attitude as Christians we should all have. If I'm a Christian... I'm a slave to Christ. I'm a bond servant, a slave, a doulos to Christ. Everything that I have is a gift from the Father. Everything I have comes from Him. And so I give of those first fruits. That's the idea. I don't give Him the last percentage of my income after all the bills have paid, after I've bought you know, another gallon of Tillamook ice cream or, or whatever it might be. I give to the Lord first. That's what we're supposed to do. And I know I've shared with our church in the past that when I was younger in the Lord, even as a young minister, times were tough. And there wasn't a whole lot of, um, in fact, there was more month at the end of the money, okay, a lot of times when, when we were young. This was before kids even. And I was the one who was writing out our tithe checks. I was the one giving. And there was a period of time, I'm ashamed to admit, but I, I will admit to you so that maybe you will learn from my shame here. There was a time when even as a minister uh, in a church years ago, I'm not going to call the church name or anything or tell you the year, but early on in my ministry, there, were, there was a time period that I stopped giving. I stopped giving unto the Lord. I stopped giving to the church because we didn't have enough money, in my mind, to feed ourselves even at that time. Making very, very little, working extra jobs, trying to put food on the table, and the money just wasn't there. My wife found out about it. My precious bride, Becky, 
beautiful Becky, precious Becky, inside and out. She found out about it and she tore into me. And guess what? Rightly so. The Lord used her as his divine judgment hand, okay? And she brought the hammer and she began to write the tithe check every week or a giving check, okay? I just said we don't tithe, but we give. You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes I slip up still and say the word tithe, but, but she began to write that check out before she paid any bills, before we bought groceries. And you know what? To my surprise and to my shame, do you realize that we had more money left over then than we did when I was doing it the other way? I know it's odd. It doesn't make sense financially, physically, but it does make sense when you talk spiritually. When we trust God first, God will take care of us. Amen? And that was a hard lesson learned when I was a young minister, a young husband, and the Lord used my precious wife to help me come to that understanding. But we give first because it's all His anyway, right? It all belongs to Him, and so we give unto the Lord. God is worthy of our time, our affections, our, our money, our talents. He's worthy of all of those things, and thus we give unto Him because He is so worthy. Worship the Lord. Tremble before Him. Say among the nations that the Lord reigns. We continue to speak forth that praise. God has established this world. It will not be moved. And He will judge all the peoples in equity, in fairness. Dear friend, can I just tell you something else today? I know our church people know this. They hear it often enough. But there is this ideal in the world today that there's so much injustice. And we're seeking justice, 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 justice. And there's this misguided notion that depending on who is the president of the United States, we will be more just as a nation, that people will get along better, that there will be more income equality and, and, and all of those kind of things. But, but dear friends, listen, please know, I don't say this uh, as a Democrat or as a Republican or as an independent. I say this as a Christian. Listen, there will never be justice on this earth until the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords returns. There will never be perfect justice until Jesus reigns from the throne in Jerusalem. And that's going to happen, which is what this psalm is pointing to. That's going to happen after the second coming of Christ that we've spoken of the last couple of Wednesday nights. At his second coming, he will establish his perfect rule and reign. Then there will be justice upon the earth, but there will not be justice before that, dear friends. We can expect more and more injustice. Now, that doesn't mean that the church turns a blind eye to injustice. That doesn't mean that, that, that we just let things go by. We should strive to be a good, just people. Amen? We should strive to do right unto the Lord first, unto our brothers and sisters in Christ, and unto our neighbors as ourselves. Amen? But justice, perfect justice, will not happen no matter who is voted into the White House or any other house for that matter. Let's move on. Let's talk about this last thing. What are we to do? We're to sing unto the Lord. We're to give unto the Lord. And finally, we are to look unto the Lord. Verse 11 and verse 12. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all it contains. Let the field exult and all that is in it. Then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy. Amen, amen, amen. That is a beautiful passage of scripture. Let the heavens be glad, the earth rejoice, the sea roar, all that's in it, the fields exult, exult the trees of the forest sing for joy. Folks, as it goes on to say in other Psalms, like Psalm 150, use the, the lyre and the harp and the, the, the clashing gong and cymbal. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen. Everything was created for the glory of God. Everything just doesn't realize it. Nature is groaning, wanting to get back to that place, according to Romans chapter 8. That the earth itself groans and moans and travails, wanting to be made whole and pure. And that won't happen until the Lord God remakes the new heaven and the new earth. Until that millennial kingdom, that perfect kingdom of righteousness and glory and splendidness is set up. Amen? That day is coming. We should long for that day. That's when justice will be served. That's when sin will be put asunder. That's when sinners will be put out of the sight in the presence of God. And that's when those of us who are in Christ, we will be able to walk in perfect harmony and unity with the Lord as He rules the earth and the heavens from His glorious throne. What a day that will be. What a day that will be. And so until then, we look unto the earth. 
our, our, the earth. We look into the Lord as the earth is even looking and longing and groaning. We look to the Lord, all creation, eagerly waiting the Lord's return. We should also eagerly await the Lord's return wanting to be set free from the pains of sin, from the stains of sin, from oppression, from, from judgment, from, from wrath at the hands of, of misguided sinful men. We should be longing for the day when the judge of all judges sits upon his glorious throne and judges in perfection and in righteousness. And what a day that will be. Amen. What a day that will be. I can't wait. I pray that you cannot wait either. So look, O oh people, unto the Lord. Now look at that last verse, verse 13. Before Yahweh, before the Lord, for he is coming. Now what's it saying? We're to do what? We're seeing the heavens be glad, the earth rejoice, the sea roar, the fields exult, then all the trees of the field will sing for joy. Where? Before the Lord. They'll sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming. For he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and all the peoples in his faithfulness. Dear friends, that is what is coming. That is what's going to happen. When the Lord God returns, he will judge in perfection, in holiness, in righteousness. And dear friends, just note that when Jesus Christ returns, oh, and, and, and he could do so by way of rapture right now, he could come for his church, his bride, the church. When that happens, we, as we looked at these last couple of weeks, yes, there will be a time of tribulation upon the earth. But at that second coming then, after the tribulation, when the feet of the Lord Jesus touch back down upon this earth at that coming, he puts down his enemies. Folks, he will establish that perfect rule and reign. What a glorious day that is going to be. That is the day that the psalmist is pointing towards here as we look unto the Lord. Friends, know that Jesus Christ is coming to reign. God's people will reign with him. We will get to take part in that rule and that reign, but that ruling and reigning by God will be for his glory. It will be in perfection. Yes, we'll take part in it, but it will be all pointing to him. It will be all about Him. Amen? We just will be blessed to be in the very presence of God at that time. Jesus will come to rule and reign. God's people will reign with Christ. But we will do that as we worship Him perfectly in that day. Now, some people ask today, what does a perfect worship service looks like? look like? And you know what my answer is? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. I'm, I'm not real sure there can be a perfect worship service right now because I'm not sure that, that everyone that attends a worship service is perfect, including myself. And it's kind of hard to worship perfectly when you're not perfect yourself. Amen? But we seek to honor the Lord with the best that we have. We come before Him bringing the best that we have to offer. We come humbly. We prepare our hearts. We prepare our minds for worship. We get prayed up before we ever show up. Amen. And so that we can come and gather with God's people and join and unite in song. And some of you may be thinking, I can't carry a tune in a bucket. And that's true. I've heard some of you sing. I know that's true for many folks. But folks, listen. God wants your heart. He wants your affection. He wants your mind, your attention. That's what he's most concerned with. And we can all make a joyful noise, can't we? We can all make a joyful noise. And so what does a perfect worship service look like? Look like? The best that I can, can, can speculate is it comes from a humble heart. It comes from a heart of brokenness. It comes from people who realize that there but for the grace of God go I, right? that I would be steeped in the sin that I was born in. I would still be wrapped up and overwhelmed and consumed by that very sin if the Lord wasn't gracious unto me and calling me unto himself in salvation. It comes from a heart of thankfulness. So if I can show up, prayed up, and I can thank God and maybe weep over my sin or the sin of my nation or, or, or the injustice that I see around me and, and call out to God for help, and still praise Him in good health and in bad health. If I can do that, I, I think we're beginning to, to, to notice what, what some of the qualities of a, of a good worship service, what a perfect worship service can look like, don't you think? Now that just scratches the surface, dear friends. But I know that what we are to do is to sing, to give, and to look unto the Lord. And so I pray that you will join with me in doing that very thing. Now this coming Sunday, we are meeting again at Grace Point in Eagle Heights. If you don't have a church home, or if your church hasn't started gathering again together, we would invite you to join us uh, there in Orange, Texas. 
If you have a church home and they're meeting, please engage with your church family. If you are a Christian, you call yourself a Christian, you recognize yourself as a Christian, but you do not have a church home, dear friend, can I just tell you, you're a walking contradiction. I don't say that to be mean and judgmental, but Christians were made for fellowship. Amen? We were made for unity. We were made to be a part of a body. We were made to encourage one another and give unto one another, help one another, worshiping the Lord together. You need to be part of a church family for your own good, and that church body needs you as well for their good. It takes all of us, dear friends, joining together to make up the body of Christ. So I encourage you to get plugged in. That is all for tonight. I hope that the bouncing around wasn't too bad. Looks like we may have frozen up here. Hopefully, uh, we will be able to, to get this moving again. Hopefully, you can still hear me. I'm going to pray and go ahead and sign off, and we'll catch you next time. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the safety of our travels. We thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to study your work, oh God. It is all that we need for life and godliness. Thank you. I'm not looking for another word from the Lord. I have your word written before me, and it is enough. It's more than enough, and there is still so much to learn and to study here in your holy word, O oh God. So thank you for this sure, tried and true word that you have given us by way of this Bible, the scriptures. Thank you for these folks, God. I pray you bless them and keep them. Make your face shine upon them, O oh God, we pray in Christ Jesus' holy name. Amen. God bless.